before I go into what what is UCIE, just just a quick uh, background on on what is a what is a chiplet. Uh, so basically, um, chiplet is a silicon die uh, with a defined set of features, uh, and uh, it has an interface to connect to other chiplets. So in most cases, the 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 chiplet standalone isn't a full featured product. It, it just has a partial set of features. Uh, it needs to be combined with other chiplets uh, to have the full product. Uh, so multiple of these chiplets are combined into a single package uh, to provide the full uh, functionality of the product. So the picture at the, at the bottom, you can see, you know, a monolithic die includes everything that's required for the product in in one single die, and it's it's much bigger. Uh, and here's an example of what uh, AMD did in the first generation Epic. Basically, this monolithic was broken into four identical dies, and then there were connections to hook these all together. Incidentally, in this uh, it was split differently um, instead of every chiplet. Uh, so here you, there are four chiplets. Each chiplet had some CPU cores, a memory controller, and then some I/O, and then the the connection points. Um, in the in the next generation, uh, it was split, where all the uh, CPU cores went on individual chiplets, and all the other I/O and memory stuff went into the central chiplet that we call. Okay. All right. So like I said, it, these um, in, in the first generation case, case each uh, chiplet could be uh, sold as an um, individual product. Uh, but in this generation, basically, uh, the, the compute dies can't be sold individually. There's no memory. There's nothing else, right? It needs to be hooked up to one of these I.O. die chiplets in order to have full functionality. can mix and match the number of these compute dies, right? So if you need a product with um, you know, certain number of CPU cores, then you can choose how many ever uh, chiplets uh, will be connected to this. So you can leave some of these connection points uh, unconnected. And what that changes is you know, how much, uh, for example, chiplets have still access to the full bandwidth uh, to memory. So uh, you know this allows uh, different kind of products to be built with essentially some smaller set of uh, you know Lego bricks. That's the idea. Uh, so um, you know, <clears throat> so what is a mobile? Roughly every eighteen to twenty-four months, and over the past, I think four or five years, that's no longer true. Uh, it's slowing down. The defect within that die has gone up uh, quite a bit. And therefore, uh, uh, you, you can have situations where the overall yield is low because the larger dies have some number of uh, defects, which makes them unusable. Chiplets, because they're smaller, um, uh, there's a lower probability of, of uh, those errors and uh, and also in terms of how many um, dies you can get out of a single you know, 300 millimeter wafer, that number is up. And therefore, generally, because the chiplets are, are smaller in size compared to the monolithic, right? you, can, uh, you can see here, if you were to pack the same number, you know, this die is much bigger than any of these individual dies uh, here. So because they are um, smaller, uh, they have, uh, much better yield uh, and therefore lower cost. Uh, and also, you know, uh, like I said, if you if you have a larger monolithic die and one piece of it goes bad, uh, let's say the memory controller or some other or clock distribution, some some major thing goes bad, then
multiple product lines. Uh, so AMD, for example, uh, takes one of these uh, CPU chiplets, uh, these CCDs, we call them, and they can be used in uh, a server configuration or a desktop CPU. And you basically do, do this chiplet design once and reuse, reuse it across, uh, across two or three different product lines. Um, and you can imagine if you if you make a, a, a chip that has like a few a, a few DDR channels, for example, a chiplet with a few DDR channels, you could use it across various product lines. That's the idea behind behind chiplets. Uh, and then they're composable in the sense that you can combine these chiplets in in different ways to create different product SKUs. Uh, so you can vary vary the number of each chiplet, or you can vary the type of chiplets, uh, uh, and therefore you can create different sets of products. And then the other big um, advantage of this is is process optimization, where each chiplet could be fabricated on a process uh, that is most optimal for whatever circuitry is going to be on that on that particular chiplet. And then this has power, and and basically th that what is optimal could be in terms of power, performance, or or cost, which translates into silicon silicon area. So one of the things, going back to this slide, uh, one of the things that um, we're seeing in the most latest processes is that while the CPU um, uh, cluster, or CPU cores themselves shrink, uh, can can benefit from shrinking from going from to smaller and smaller process technologies. Some of these I/O uh, uh, components don't scale the same way. Similarly, you know, large caches don't scale the same way. So, um, uh, you know, even if you if you, even if you were to put one of these memory controllers in this die the size won't change from one generation to the next or, or changes very uh, very little between one process generation to the next because these are IO, the analog dominated and analog circuits don't seem to scale uh, as well as pure digital circuits. Uh, so it, it's advantageous to build these things in an older process because they don't benefit from going to a newer process anyway. Um, and and the older process is generally more mature and lower cost, so uh, there's also cost benefit from sticking to an older process. So in this uh, example here, the CPUs moved to um, seven nanometers, but the I/O stayed at 14, which is you know a couple of generations older. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the idea behind behind chiplets. Then uh, the question becomes, okay, it's, we have all these chiplets, it's great. Well, how do we connect all of them together? So, so far um, it's always been, um, you know, uh, proprietary protocols, um, AMD developed their own, other companies came up with their own way. And um, because it was just, we we're just using chiplets between the same company, right? So AMD designed both sides of, of those, uh, of those products, um, we could define our own protocol. But there's clearly, you can see there is a benefit to have a standardized protocol so that you can mix and match uh, uh, these chiplets from, from different vendors and with different capabilities. So that's kind of the rationale behind UCIE, uh, which um, stands for Universal Chiplet Interconnect Express, which is a nod to PCI Express. Uh, and this is an um, open specification for for die to die um, connections between chiplets. And like I said, the the goal is to enable uh, use of chiplets from different vendors in a, in a single package, just like you can do today with PCIe devices. You can buy any PCIe card from any vendor and plug it into a standard PCIe slot, and it works. <clears throat> So the standard initially was mostly worked on by by Intel, but then uh, pretty soon, early on, you know, AMD, ARM, Qualcomm, Samsung, TSMC, all of them uh, joined um, in this uh, consortium, and Nvidia uh, and a couple other companies uh, joined uh, a little bit later. So. Uh, version 1.0 of the spec was uh, released early last year and uh, the 1.1 spec was just released a couple of months ago. 
and it's open. You can go to the UCIE website and, and download them. You do have to give them your email address, as I found out. Uh, so what is, what is UCIE and what does it specify? So um, the UCIE basically uh, specifies both kind of the, the stack uh, on the physical layer and the link layer and so forth, and also uh, specifies kind of how, what kind of packaging techniques you would use to combine these together. So the picture on the left here shows kind of the, the, the different different layers. And so at the bottom, you have the physical layer and similar to PCIe, this deals with all the electrical parts uh, of, the, of the connection, you know, voltage and so forth. Um, there are uh, multiple lanes, so you, you have to train it when you have to go to um, uh, higher speed. So basically what, what training um, means is you need to find out how much delay there was so that the data and the clock uh, can be aligned, right? So they, they, the, the, they could be based on the distance between the two chiplets and you know, the resistance uh, uh, in between, uh, there is a time of flight, right? F signal going from one chiplet to another. And so you need to train for that so that your clock and data edge uh, are aligned so that clock arrives just a little bit after the, the data arrives so that on your rising edge of the clock, the data signal is stable and you can latch, latch that, that data. Uh, so <clears throat> um, there are some other uh, uh, things that you can put into scramble and things like this, but some of that is, is uh, optional. And the way this works is that the sender sends the clock along with the data and then the receiver uh, uses that same clock uh, to, to get it. So that's why you have this uh, clock forwarding uh, logic. So one level above is the is the die to die uh, adapter, and this is um, kind of your link layer uh, above, and it's and it's basically specifies um, if you're trying to mul multiplex multiple signals uh, onto one interface, you do it in this layer. Uh, there's retry, so if errors were detected, you know you you send some CRC bits along, and if there was errors in the transmission, you retry the the transmission. And then there's link state and power management uh, here. So if the link is idle, then you can choose to limit the number of lanes or um, go down to lower speed, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then at the top is the protocol layer um, work. So these two are fairly well defined at the moment. Uh, there's still work going on at the, at the protocol level uh, to define how this would work. On the right here are the different kind of packaging schemes on how you would take these different uh, chiplets, which are these dies in this picture here, and uh, connect them together into a single SOC package. Uh, what is called standard package um, is uh, what is now typically being used. Uh, and uh, what what is this, this, this green thing at the bottom is a substrate layer. It's usually some kind of PCB-like material, if you will. And you place the dies on top. At, similar to PCB traces, you have wires connecting um, signals on one die to the other die. And then for the other ones, it will, will feed through to the bottom and you will have uh, the pins or bumps at, at the bottom. And so this bottom part would watch would attach to your, your motherboard. And so some of these um, uh, signals from each die would feed through into the into the, to, to a motherboard connection and others will be used for these die-to-die -die connections. So this is um, called standard package and it's, it's, it's relatively cheap, uh, but um, there are, you know, it, it, it there, it, uses more power and there's some other limitations uh, with this one. So then you go into these different examples of uh, advanced packaging. Uh, and uh, the most common that uh, is sort of the next one that people are looking at is, um, is this thing called Silicon Bridge. Intel calls it EMIB or embedded 
um, uh, forgot what that means. Uh, uh, something bridge, uh, forget what what it stands for. But other vendors call it differently, um, fan out bridge and things like this. But basically what it is, is this light blue thing that you see here is another piece of silicon that is embedded into the substrate. So this package substrate and this package substrate are the same, but except of running wires through the substrate directly, you embed another piece of silicon, uh, which is the bridge. And then these wires are, are similar to uh, wires deposited on, on any other die. So this is another piece of silicon. Just think of it as being flipped upside down and, and, and the connection is made between this top die and the bottom die. And it's just a sliver to connect uh, the number of signals on this side to the other one. And you have another one for how many ever die to die connections uh, you need. Uh, so this is, you know, this is uh, one variant of what we call 2.5D packaging. So this is 2D packaging. So everything is in two dimensions, and this is 2.5D. Uh, the the there is another version, or sorry, the next step is where instead of having this embedded in the package, you just have a full slab of silicon, and uh, you have the wires through them, and that's that's this interposer. Uh, and then you can go into kind of more esoteric. Uh, uh, sort of the only thing that is being dictated here is sort of the the pitch, right? So you have to, the pitch between these two is the pitch is high because you need to draw these wires through the substrate. But you can go to smaller and smaller pitches since this is all in silicon. But, but there is no, um, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, limitation on what these dyes can be, uh, you know, what process node, uh, all that is uh, orthogonal to the, the UCIE spec. Okay. Uh, right. Um, so protocols, right, we talked about that this, um, this top layer, which is the protocol layer is, um, is uh, not fully defined. Uh, so currently uh, what the UCIE does is it provides a mapping for PCIe and CXL. So all variants of CXL, IO, MEM, and CACHE uh, 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 to allow uh, these to do, uh, to go over UCIE. And this is basically a path for, if you have two different uh, chips that are connected uh, by a PCIe link or a CXL link, um, you could convert those two chips into chiplets and put them on a package and connect them over UCIE. So that's the idea for basically taking things that are at a board level today and integrating them into a package level. So, um, so that's why the first thing that the UCIE folks uh, tackled was getting PCIE and CXL uh, mapped. Uh, so it now also defines something called it called streaming protocol to map other other protocols, but this is essentially you can just think of it as like here's a bunch of wires and you de decide how you're going to send your data across these wires and which wire means what right so there's there's this open thing they they call them bunch of wires or sea of wires is different terminology and um, that one the protocol. Uh, definition is left to the uh, to the vendor to to define. So it still allows um, if AMD or any other company were to uh, define a, a custom protocol for two chiplets that the same vendor makes, and they think that going through over over this one of these other protocols is going to be less efficient, and they can customize a protocol for their particular application you could still do that and you can reuse um, reuse these uh, bottom layers. It's just this layer that would be different. So you can imagine um, third party vendors uh, creating um, IP um, or, or designs for these two layers, and then you can integrate it with whatever you want to do uh, up here at the, at the protocol layer. Uh, and then there's some work that's continuing to define some other protocols for some other common um, current and some expected future use cases. 
but those are not uh, released yet. So this is where I think the most of the work um, is is happening. Uh, and <clears throat> so we talked about the the use case where you know everything is within a package, which is this left hand side picture where you have these different uh, chiplets and then you connect them through these UCIE connections. Um, there's also um, thought given uh, from the UCIE side about how you can extend it off package, right? So um, they, they find something called uh, retimers, which are basically adapters to connect it to other kind of things. So at this point, it starts looking like CXL um, uh, to connect uh, between different um, chips or different packages or different even um, board level, right? You can go, uh, once you go optical and everything, you can you can go across a rack. Uh, so there is provision for extending this uh, to rack scale uh, connections. Um, but again, those are not fully defined yet, but that's the idea that you can take the same protocol, extend it all the way to a rack um, in a data center. Uh, and then this is my last slide. So um, a lot of these I lifted from the UCIE white paper, by the way, which is also available on, on the website along with the spec. Um, and the uh, so UCIE currently, this is as of uh, 1.0. I don't think this, I've, uh, this uh, reflects the latest 1.1, but as of 1.0, uh, basically you're talking about data rates up to 32, uh, gigabits per second per uh, per what they call lane or per wire. And you have um, 64 um, lanes available uh, in advanced package, only 16 in the in the standard package. And like I said, um, this is where the uh, if it's a standard package, because these wires have to be uh, go going through the, the substrate, the pitch between two different bumps at the bottom of, of the chiplet has to be pretty big. So in this case, 100 to 130 um, uh, microns. But if you use advanced packaging, because now those wires also go through a piece of silicon, your pitch, bump pitch is, is much smaller. Uh, and, and because this has to go through another piece of silicon, uh, the, the the basically the distance right uh, if i go back to this this picture so this distance right between two dies on a package on a standard package this can be up to 25 millimeters uh, but if you want to do any of these advanced packaging with uh, with a slab of silicon underneath uh, this distance is limited to less than two millimeters and you can see uh, actually i didn't include the picture but if you if you look at the pictures of the latest AMD EPIC chips, you'll see they're all bunched very closely together. Uh, uh, the other kind of important thing when it comes to chiplets is what we call shoreline or beachfront. Uh, and because uh, you have to place these, um, uh, I should have done this better. Uh, if I go back to this picture, uh, you know, you this is this is what we call beachfront or shoreline. So depending on how many um, signals you want to get across uh, and the pitch, right, bump pitch between them, that defines uh, dimensions of this chiplet. So it can't be less than a certain width if you have um, a, a large number of wires, right? So depending on the number of wires that have to connect across uh, these two chiplets, uh, there is this beachfront that you have to determine. So that determines when you def when you design these chiplets, how much area, how much uh, space here do I need to allocate for these die-to-die -die connections? Uh, <clears throat> so that's another kind of in important consideration um, in in the in the design. And as you can see, the 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 power uh, what would define as picojoules to send one bit across. Um, uh, it's much better than an advanced package, again, because it's going through um, through um, silicon. And um, 
uh, and then the latency uh, through this, right? So it's it's uh, the target is to be less than two nanoseconds. I don't believe um, any of the vendors today have quite reached that level, uh, but that's the but that's the goal. And then um, reliability-wise, it's supposed to be very close to having being the same as wires uh, within within a chip. So uh, very very small um, error rate. But um, like I said, if you cannot tolerate any errors, then you have CRC and retry mechanisms uh, to replay the the transaction. Um, assuming there was some transient error in the in the transmission. Anyway, that's it. Any any questions? That okay, is, thank you, Shankar. That is an okay. incredible incredible standard. Uh, what, what's the time frame for rollout on this, Shankar? <sighs> Anybody's guess. Uh, I think I think that is um, I, I, at least I know uh, a lot of the IP vendors are are working on on define uh, on building these bottom two layer pieces. Um, I know um, AMD is uh, slowly going to uh, transition from uh, from our proprietary um, mechanisms to to go. Um, to UCIE where where appropriate. Uh, not all products might go, uh, but uh, any place where we want to be able to integrate um, third party um, solutions uh, will certainly go to this standard. I think Intel is also very close to adopting this. Um, I don't know about NVIDIA and some of the other companies, but uh, there is there is a broad, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, trying to look for the word. Uh, basically, everybody is coalescing around this this standard. Uh, there were a couple of other things defined before, but I think they have all fallen to the wayside. Yes. But it should be coming out in the next few years. It it obviously takes a while. The standard just got released. It takes a while for all these designs to be completed and tested and and validated. So it'll take a few years, but. Uh, I don't know the exact timeline. Any other questions? All right, I'll turn it over to Kurt then. Okay. Okay. I don't think I've got my screen sharing working. So what I might do, especially since Professor Jelinski has got a bunch of people queued up. Um, let me try one. Try one thing. Let me try this. Don't, um, and then maybe see, I might be able to go in a screen share if I do it from from my Chrome tab. Let me try that. Okay, we're seeing it now. Yeah, let me see if it'll let me uh, slideshow it. Okay, well, let me try this, if this works. Um, the reason I'm showing this slide, I was just going to drop it in there. This is a, I think we need to have a moment of silence for the, uh, for the final Bertucci's shutdown of the Central Square location because hmm. I got to figure BLU was good for maybe, what do you think, Jerry, about 1,000 pizza over the course of the last 20 or so years? <laughs> I'm okay. sure. I'm sure. Because <laughs> we used to buy, you know, during the Linux, uh, yeah. um, your Saturday events, right? Well, many so years ago, I was working for a company in Central Square, in Porter Square. And my boss made a reservation at Bertucci's. And we walked over to it. They didn't have the reservation. He mistakenly made it for the one in Central Square, <laughs> which was brand new at the time. Yeah. And at the time, Bertucci's only had two restaurants, the one in uh, Elm Street in um, Davis Square, which was their original, and uh, this one in Cambridge. Yep. And you know the story about how this came about, right? That uh, Steve, 
yep. Steve's is famous for an ice cream shop. Yep. And he didn't want any competition in Davis Square. So when yep. somebody thought they were going to build a second ice cream shop in uh, in Davis Square, he said, the hell you are. And he put some some Italian food restaurant in there, <laughs> called it Bertucci's. And of course, nobody remembers Steve's ice cream, but everybody remembers Bertucci's. So yeah. that's, that's a pretty funny story. Well, that was Joey. Joey, okay. That wasn't Steve. Steve Which, sold Steve's to Joey. Okay. And Bertucci was a fake last name, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, just tell me. I'm I'm flying blind here since I'm in a Chrome tab. So just tell me if uh, if this okay. thing's advancing. Um, it advanced. Okay. So one era ends where we have we have moved on from Bertucci's, and we're gonna go to I don't know what we're gonna be eating for food in the in the future. But uh, but also all of the bugs. All of the bugs in Boston are shutting down. I think BLU is the last of the original uh, lugs. Um, Jerry, do they still have the the lug stock or the or the the big lug in Marlboro that used used to arrange with all the local lugs? Uh, no, but I think the New Hampshire lug is still working. Oh, okay. All when right. Did they, when did they change the name? The what? It used to be the Boston User Groups, and now it's Boston Unity Group. No. no. It's that is no, I, I have actually, Boston User Group is actually paying for our server. <laughs> oh, so it's a different bug. Because yeah. I, have, I have money there, and that was the way it was arranged in the first place. And uh, the BLU has as much money in its treasury as uh, Jabber has in his checking account. Yeah, and, and BMUG is now... Boston BBS. Now, if that isn't a legacy URL, I don't know mm -hmm. what it is. But. Mm. All right. So I'm not going to touch. And thank you, Shankar. That was about as good of a segue as I could have possibly have predicted. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the Compute Express link uh, standard today. I think what I'll do, especially if Jabber is looking for a speaker in November or December, um, I'm coming back from another big CXL event um, CXL forum is going on this week at Open Compute at, uh, at you know Meta Open Compute, and so there's going to be a bunch of new standards and and um, uh, discussions and announcements over the course of the next two weeks. So when I get back from the CXL BOF that I'm going to November 9th, I think it is, maybe I'll be able to talk, and I could probably fill two hours at that point. I can not only give a a CXL tutorial. But I could talk more about how CXL is going to impact our our immediate future. So, so that's why I'm going to tear through the spec. I'll be even lighter on the spec uh, with this bunch of slides than. Uh, uh, but, but like I say, I'll, I'll hit. Shankar briefly touched upon the three important sub protocols: CXL.mem, CXL.io, and CXL.cache. For my money, and especially now with the CXL 1.1 standard available in the wild. And to a lesser extent, CXL 2.0 available in the wild if you buy certain um, motherboards. Uh, it's all about the CXL.mem. So that's kind of what I'm going to be talking about. And in particular, as it applies to um, high performance computing, supercomputing, uh, university research computing, um, you, take a, you take a place like uh, the five research universities in Boston. Uh, we're all members of the Massachusetts Green High Performance Computing Center. We get to log on and use the supercomputers there. And not only is it very memory centric, how we have to have to describe our our um, our jobs and our batch files, but uh, it almost everything's memory bound. If you know anything about how to tune your codes, you quickly discover that you know uh, application parallel, data parallel. You you discover very quickly that if you want to maximize your time on these on these supercomputers at these universities, especially the university ones that have have a uh, you know a, a huge data center associated with them, University of Texas has TAC, uh, UCSD has the San Diego Supercomputing Center. There's places you can go where you can request a job, put it into a queue, and almost everybody is subscribing. This is the um, NSF access slash exceed campus champions list and and almost everyone i would say 90 percent of all the 
sysadmins and, and operators there have subscribed to the Slurm standard as their queuing system. And so uh, Slurm is a, is, has a very rich ecosystem. You can, you can be very granular. You'll see that I pulled up a page there from the uh, MGHPCC TXE1, otherwise known as MIT SuperCloud. Now, that tells you how many CPUs you could access, which you're sharing with you know, another 1,000 people probably at the same time you want to access it. Um, but if you know what you're doing with your, with your batch jobs and you've worked out some deal with the, with the sysadmins, mostly by, by taking higher level um, remote courses and proving to the, to the sysadmins that you know how to, how to describe a job and how to submit it as a batch file, you can get access to some, some pretty heavy duty resources, either a ton of GPUs simultaneously or uh, what's, what's in much more abundance is a ton of CPUs for long periods of time. If you've got a three week job, you, uh, you can request that. Uh, you have to probably qualify by taking these little mini courses. And, uh, and so what they'll do is at a place like at SuperCloud is you'll go through this effort and you'll either describe in your batch file, which will, it probably just won't sail through. You know, you'll hit go and you'll probably get a job ID back. But what's much more likely is uh, you'll, you'll uh, have some interaction with a sysadmin and they'll, and they'll look at your sbatch file and, and, and try to refine it a little bit more, tell you how to break it up into jobs, um, defining, um, defining uh, nodes, full nodes, uh, you know, threads per node, possibly memory per thread. But generally speaking, what the sysadmins tell you at these at these supercomputing centers is, look, if you want more memory, just request more CPUs. That's kind of the the shorthand uh, what they're doing now because because like I say, there there's a, a an imbalance right now, especially given what has happened with uh, the supply chain over the last two years between how many CPUs um, a university data center can offer you and how many GPUs for you and uh you know uh, there's a lot of contention we have some defined rules on who gets better nice levels and there's a whole raft I, I won't get into too much of that right now but i will get into it when we start talking about some of the some of the fine-grained memory allocation stuff that you can do with uh either uh, uh by yourself outside of a queuing system in cxl or what's even better is some of these internals in the uh, either in Slurm or in some of the other um, queuing systems. Like I say, most most of the research computing, uh, the university associated research computing departments I know of, uh, they've all kind of migrated to Slurm because uh, because of the rich, rich ecosystem. It, it started out as you know open source, and people have built in their extensions and and. Uh, uh, and, and as a new tech comes out, uh, you can take advantage of, of, uh, of, of some of these, these open source additions. Um, so I've lost, yeah, see, when I imported into, into um, docs, it kind of ate some of this. But this was my list of, of conferences that, um, that are either talking about CXL now or have always been talking about memory. Now, uh, all the things that we had workarounds for prior to the Beowulf era um, are now back in play. Because if, you, if you've got an application that will grab as much memory as you can give it, and you need four terabytes, um, you, can, you can get that now through CXL. Uh, to, to a great extent, you can get it now through the CXL 1.1, which, like I say, you can, you can buy a commodity server right now that has, that'll support that protocol. And it certainly is available under CXL 2.0. If you've got these, um, if you've got, uh, so C CXL 2.0 requires PCI Express 5. Now that doesn't describe too many motherboards right now, but if you go out and buy a system that has PCI Express 5, you're almost certainly uh, able to run CXL on it. In which case you buy CXL um, empowered, enabled uh, PCI host adapters and you'll be able to access the RAM on those cards if they're a GPU or a DPU or whatever. And it will 
it will present itself to the host operating system as system RAM. So if you've got a job that needs two terabytes of RAM and you've got that spread over eight uh, PCIe 5.0 cards, CXL enabled uh, host adapters, then then you can run it. And uh, I think we, like I say, if if I'm doing this again before the end of the year, I'll be able to, to live demo some of that because most of these, all the products that I know will uh, support CXL 2.0, some of them will be available after November 12th, which is when they're going to be announced at, at IEEE Supercomputing in Denver. So now I have a couple of other ones. The reason I, I put the RISC V focus conferences in there is because the RISC V folks, especially the HPC RISC V devs, are very interested in these extended uh, memory addressing uh, schemes. Uh, certainly, you're not buying a system now that'll give you, even though you've got a 32-bit processor, you're not getting, or excuse me, a 64-bit processor, you're not getting 64 bits of memory. Um, but you can with some of the, uh, you know, there's an S SV57 and S SV64 and SV128 extension in the, the RISC-V developers are doing. You can get that now if if you're totally cool with running it on an FPGA, but I think you'll probably see that in Silica pretty soon too. And then there's two more conferences in there. The um, uh, Boston Area Architecture Workshop that Professor Jelinski and I run. Uh, we didn't do one this year and it doesn't look like we'll be able to make it this year, but maybe we'll fold it into Latch Up, which is coming to Massachusetts sometime next year, probably probably March, uh, but stay tuned on that. We'll, we'll have insights into that here pretty soon too. The other link I put in there, the Bitly uh, Princeton Computer Architecture Day. This is um, a guy, Professor Wentzloff, down in uh, down at Princeton, uh, invites. Uh, it's pretty much open to local academics that that want to come and bring their bring their grad students and their advisees and sit in on his. He's uh, um, he. I don't think he's the head of the de department, but he's got a couple of really interesting architectures that he uh, that he works on down there. Open Python. And then he does quite a bit with RISC V as well. So I'm sorry that I will move on from this page. Uh, but the paper counts in compute for Compute Express Link uh, have have dramatically. If you had done a search for com Compute Express Link at IEEE Explorer a year ago, you wouldn't have gotten any hits. Now now you got 588. Um, okay, so uh, PCI host adapters. If you have a code and you're like, hey, I want to run this on a GPU, let me see uh, what, uh, you know, uh, if I can get a computational fluid dynamic code or a QCD code or something, let me go to out there and find out w what community supports this and, and how to get it and how to tune it. Well, certainly NVIDIA used to hand out a little green magazine that had all the codes that they have, have certified uh, there's a CUDA port for. And I believe to a lesser extent you can probably get this for uh, Rockham HIP uh, for the AMD Instinct line of GPUs. You can find out what codes have been certified to run on their on their tech. So uh, if, if that's what you're interested in, if you want to wait around for a year and a half for, um, you know, to, to, to get an NVIDIA GPU, then, then, you know, good luck to you. However, oh, I'm going to have to come back to this slide. However, if you've got a C or C++ code that you want to run today, and it only runs on CPUs, and that, that describes a lot of codes. I, I believe WARF, weather reporting and forecasting, which is an extremely popular code, I don't believe there's a, a GPU port for that. I guess there's some parts that just don't, that, you know, the, the in, intrinsic parallelism is kind of hard to coax out of WARF. It's a, that code's been around a long time certainly more than 20 years old, so, so it preceded GPUs. Um, it's it's uh, hard to get that code to run on GPUs, but it's not hard to get it to run on CPUs. It's just that we didn't have access to huge chunks of memory and large CPU counts until now. And so you can go out to a site and download the code. This one here is Open Novation. Myself and some of the students run this one, and we're trying to update it and pre-build some binaries for, for particular um, uh, particular architectures and, and, uh, and distros. Um, we've identified over the course of the last, um, well, here again, more than a dozen years, um, every time the student cluster contest announced a mystery app, 
uh, in the old days, it used to be one that, that had already appeared previously in a, in a student cluster competition. Now they've kind of gotten clever. I think they, they figured we were looking at, at pre-compiling some of these things from previous years. Now we were doing this mostly as an exercise on how to get smart on uh, optimization and profiling and, and you know learning some of the different libraries that you wanna use when you're preparing for the student cluster competition. And it's a good exercise. It's just that we never really, we kind of had a lottery to see if we could actually somehow figure out what this year's mystery app was gonna be. And I don't think we ever got it right, but we certainly got pretty handy with some of the codes that made multiple ap appearances in the student cluster contest. So, <clears throat> so our group has been talking about putting together a CXL supercomputer uh, for two reasons. Um, mostly uh, to follow along with the spec and possibly build it big enough so that it looks a lot like this particular graphic here is a photo of the um, D.E. Shaw research uh, Anton and Anton II supercomputer. Now, when, when D.E. Shaw built this, he was targeting a particular protein folding problem. And he knew that, that this system was gonna be air gapped uh, to, to anything, to the internet, and whatever. So he said, okay, well, I, I don't know if I need to subscribe to standards all the way around. He had, um, he had a mixed precision problem being solved by a, a tensilica chip in this design. So his board would have a tensilica chip to handle part of his, his calculation. And he was like, okay, I don't know if this really lends itself to um, general purpose. You can get time on this supercomputer at the uh, Pittsburgh supercomputing center. You uh, put in a proposal and, and you, and you learn about the um, particular uh, curious ways that you have to, uh, you know, describe your job and, and tune your code to run on it. But uh, but what I think is interesting about this and why it would be a good uh, tale to build around for the CXL supercomputer is they won the the Gordon Bell Prize that year. So that 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 was interesting two ways. They um, so he not only did did uh, did good. He solved a protein folding problem at about 10 times the speed of a, uh, you know, of a commodity screensaver, uh, <laughs> no matter how many processors it was running on. Um, but he also did well. I mean, this is a company that, that trades on Wall Street and they wanted to find out how to, uh, you know, tune particular algorithms, uh, speed up high throughput codes and things like that. So, so kudos to him for, for solving a couple of our problems at the, at the same time. Um, I mean, D. Shaw was a was a chemist by by training. That's right, and and a professor yeah. at at Berkeley or something, right? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Okay. And so he made a ton of money on on the stock market, but his passion was solving these chem chemistry problems. So that's why he funded this whole effort. That's right. Yep. And part yep. of his team, uh, at least until recently, was uh, a professor at MIT, who I believe has now also gone back to some university in California. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so it's a fascinating story, and yeah. it's and it's why um you know I was hoping he'd show up at HPC on Wall Street one of these days and and uh, and say yeah you know there's there's a place for HPC on Wall Street there there's certainly an, a place for HTPC on Wall Street, I mean you go to the vendors room down there and people are overclocking their commodity servers, you know and selling them without a warranty, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty crazy, um so look. I'll tear through my last couple of slides. This is this is kind of so so the old paradigm, and we've talked about it here a lot. You know, when the Beowulf book came out and the Beowulf cluster movement started, it looked like a way to solve. People couldn't really figure out how to do the compute communication overlap sufficiently to ever make anything more than a memory bound problem, and it's and this you know has has perpetuated until today. You know, people said, okay, well, let's divide this problem up. There's no reason we should have to do uh, make dash J one to everything. Let's just, let's divide the job up. A lot of this stuff is paralyzable. We'll totally kill Amdahl's law because, you know, if, if Amdahl's law is going to choke you when you've only got eight computers, well, let's have, you know, like, like SuperCloud has, let's, let's have 380,000, uh, you know, cores. And and then Amdahl's law probably won't kill you because first of all, nothing ever goes from many to one anymore. You know, we're the, the 
I can't think of a scenario. Every, every processor is multi-core now. So it's not like, you know, with an SMP kernel, an open MP kernel. So, so where, where things are going from many to one, I don't know if that exists anymore. So what, what folks decided to do in the embarrassingly parallel business is like, Hey, we've got these, we got these 64 bit widths. Let's, let's send two floats down it instead of one double. We'll get to double. If I need to submit my document to you and have my statistician sign off on it, that it's a native double precision, we'll do that. But in the meantime, I'm going to get 2x the performance because I'm, I'm doing either two floats and then iteratively finding it back to double precision. Or what they're doing now is all these exotic precisions, uh, B float. Um, there's plenty of people doing AI and ML at, in integer and, and, you know, I don't know if you can do one bit, but they're probably going to try it. So int, int eight is where, where it is now. Is and that right? Are, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're like a bunch of things using. And then I think float eight is also being looked at like where, uh, you know, you just have one bit for the exponent and then everything else is Mantisa because for a lot of these things, the, the whole, uh, ranges between um, minus one and plus one. So they don't need <laughs> a bunch of exponent bits. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, there's only really, so there's two or three kinds of research that do need the uh, that that dynamic range. I understand that if you're a, um, uh, if you're a black hole researcher, you need like octal precision or something crazy like mm -hmm. that. So <laughs> yeah, other than that. No, but if if you just want to determine if a picture is of a cat, you know, eight bits is enough. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, so what I think I might do, this is a picture of me when I worked at uh, at Microway. This is, okay, so this is certainly pre-GPU. I think this is just when Opterons were coming in and, and thank, you know, thanks to AMD for the Opteron revolution because that really allowed people you know, dopes like me that it could only do 32-bit operating systems and 32-bit applications to actually screw around with 64-bit applications before, um, or actually it's always the other way around, right? You could go from legacy mode to long mode because you could get a 64-bit operating system. I didn't have to figure that out, but I did have to figure out 64-bit applications. So, mm -hmm. so we were- You had alpha, you could do that before, or MIPS. Well, that, <laughs> well, you couldn't do the mixed mode like you could do with Opteron. Yes, 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 yes. And so what people were doing were they, they were buying these Opteron systems and and fielding their 32, 32s, and then eventually growing into, um, uh, you know, into, lo into long mode. Yep. And, yep. and to make things even better was this is back when we were, we were you know, we were putting socketed chips in. And pulling them out, so so it wasn't like you had to upgrade the entire machine to to get you know uh, sixty four bit applications running. So this was um, this was definitely uh, the smart smart thing to do. It was so smart that Intel ended up licensing it from AMD. So um, yeah, so I I think what I'll do now that I know um, now that I've seen Shankar's slides, I think I'm going to put a full CXL tutorial together with. And, and Jabber, I'll, I'll work with you maybe before the end of the year, we can do that. Um, but in the meantime, I will stop sharing my screen here. That's per, oh, geez, perfect timing. I mean, CXL, oh, yeah. just, just to expand on what you said, Kurt, like I think I think a lot of these mega data centers, right, cloud providers are, are looking at CXL.mem very, very closely. A, to, because like you said, so many applications need large amounts of memory. And as we see the shift basically from DDR4 to DDR5, they're thinking they can have CXL modules to then, they can then put down all the old DDR4 DIMMs that they already have, right? Onto these riser cards and expand their memory pool and then eventually replace those with all DDR5 down the line. So they have these controllers that can do both DDR4 and DDR5 with a CXL bridge, essentially. Yep. And, and you know, unless you're part of that 2% that of, of GPU rich out there, you ain't <laughs> getting any, any shipments of any 
you know, any hopper systems this year. Yep. I, just, I know lots of universities that are in the queue and they can wait. They can wait until after, you know, GPT-7 or something. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what they're in line with. You, yep. know, you know, Elon Musk bought the entire run of GPUs one year. And it was like, how do you compete with that kind yeah, of yeah. leverage, right? So, yeah. So we'll we'll have to. Apple wait. bought all of TSMC three nanometers, so you know, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, it's it, you have to deal with that. Yeah, that's right. Get in line. Yeah.